Hello, everyone. This is JT Keating with Imperium. I'd like to welcome you to a special edition uh, webcast and uh, educational session. I'm going to wait a couple seconds as folks continue to, to load in. Um, usual kind of perfunctory conversation. We'll probably uh, try and keep this to 20, 25 minutes worth of actual content and then have Q&A at the end. Um, this is definitely a topic that a lot of people are going to have a lot of questions on. Um, so please use the Q&A capability early and often. If I see that there's uh, something that I think would really fit in the context of the flow of the presentation, um, I'll even drop some of the questions in uh, in the middle of the conversation. Um, there will be an archived version of this up on the website within a day. Um, and if anybody's interested, we can also make the, the slides available to you. And of course, we're always here to, to help you. So with that, um, we're going to dive in. Uh, obviously, this has been uh, big news. Um, I'm going to moderate the session, but the good news for all of you is I'm actually not going to be doing most of the content. Um, the content is actually going to come from a couple of our experts. Uh, Nico, who is our VP of Security Research, and he's the head of Z Labs, um, our mobile threat research team around the world, which is incredible. So, Nico, thanks for uh, thanks for joining me. Thanks, JT. Good to see you again, my friend. Um, and also, Kerm Smith, who's our VP of Solutions Engineering. Um, most of the time, we uh, we don't spend any time on our product in these sessions. We're not going to spend a lot of time on the product, but we are going to talk about how do you need to protect yourself? How can you protect yourself? And we're going to definitely talk about how we are able to protect Zimperium customers with our technology. And nobody knows more about this stuff than Kern, who even before he was here, was in the MDM space with AirWatch, now Workspace ONE um, with VMware. So Kern, thanks for joining me as well. Thanks for having me, JT. Looking forward to it. So, um, so we're going to dive in real quick. Uh, let's let's first just deal with kind of setting the stage, just to make sure we're all in the same you know right webinar. It's kind of like when you get on a plane and they say, "Hey, we're going to Cleveland." You might want to get off if you're not going to Cleveland. Um, so, Pegasus has been in the news again, right? Um, we're going to spend a lot of time this specific session. We're really going to be diving into Pegasus, um, what it is where we've seen it, what it does, what everybody's at risk. But we're also going to be pointing out the commonalities between it and other attacks of the same nature. Um, because the reality is uh, sophisticated techniques like this constantly take advantage of zero days, and they're constantly using new ways to exploit devices. And you need to respond with a machine learning detection capability, not any kind of a signature-based technology, because just it just blows right by it, right? The current version, it was originally discovered and talked about back in 2016. We've been protecting with machine learning against it even before it was discovered. But the current version is in the news again um, because of the fact that there was a leak of 50,000 some odd numbers, um, almost all having to do with reporters, activists, even some government officials, largely from Western um, uh, government organizations. So there's this huge list that's out there and there's been all these different questions again about the, the publisher of it and whether or not they were selling it to governments that shouldn't be using it. And there's that whole side of things. What I would caution people is in a few ways. One, don't get super wrapped up in the hype and super wrapped up in the, the espionage and the intrigue and all the rest of that kind of fun stuff because then it'd be very easy to go, well, I might not be a target. Now, the fact that we literally have hundreds of people on this call shows that people are concerned about it as you should be. We're gonna talk about Pegasus again, and we're gonna talk about other threats as well. But I think a lot of times when we get wrapped into the, the uh, explosive headlines, it's very easy to confuse ourselves and not think that we might uh, have to worry about things along these lines. So. That's why it's in the news again. You can read it all over the place. There's been some great coverage in different places. The Guardian actually has outstanding podcasts in various different parts of this entire thing, if you really want to dive into it deep. But let's pivot now to Nico. And Nico, everybody's heard a lot about Pegasus. Can you first help us understand what do we know, what have we seen in terms of how Pegasus, what's the kill chain? How it actually gets onto the device. Then after we're done with that part, 
we will move over to what it can do. So first, can you just give us a, a little bit of a, a lesson on Pegasus in terms of what we've seen in terms of the, the ability for it to come onto a device and compromise the device? Sure. So actually, the most uh, interesting thing about Pegasus is exactly that, is how it gets into the device. Other than that, it's uh, very similar to a um, lot, lot of other um, spywares. So the way Pegasus is getting to the device has been changing. So the first campaign that we know of, it's from 2015. And in that case, it was they were sending an SMS with a spear phishing link, and then uh, they were using uh, our WebKit exploit in order to compromise the device and, and get into it. Uh, then that was changed to network injection methods. Uh, what they were doing is they were um, basically treating a lot of redirections in the network. Uh, someone reported that was, for example, visiting Yahoo, and from Yahoo got redirected to a um, domain that was under NSO control which is one of the most uh, efficient techniques to do it, but that requires some uh, collaboration with the so network providers, right? So this can only be implemented in certain countries. Uh, but if you want to target some, someone that is abroad, then you need to do something different. And in this case, what they, are, uh, they were doing is actually exploiting uh, zero days and zero clicks in several applications. So some of them actually are the iMessage application, uh, the photo app application and the even Apple Music. But in every case, what they were doing is they were contacting some uh, domain under NSO control and getting a payload and then exploding some sort of WebKit vulnerability and getting into the device. So yeah, so I think it's I think it's critical. And then Kern, I'll uh, see if you have any other you know commentary to add to this. I do think it's critical to point out. To, to a few things. One, as you were just discussing, uh, Nico, the, the fact that there's the kind of the bait, the hook, the, the so, some form usually of social engineering, could be phishing, could be malware, or whatever the case may be, it happens to be phishing in this particular example. Then there's the exploit. And that one of the things we've definitely seen in the evolution, as you were talking about from 2015 to now, is the ability for Pegasus to get closer and closer and closer to zero click, right? Taking advantage of, and they're constantly in the market for exploits. Um, there's a reason why both Apple and Google are putting out a record number of security patches because there's new vulnerabilities all the time and organizations, this just happens to be in the press with NSO, but even other organizations that aren't in the press taking advantage of these vulnerabilities to then deliver zero click exploits is, is critical to being able to take over the device. Kern, any, before we shift over to what Pegasus can actually do and see, yeah. any other comments on the, uh, on the kill chain? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think the method of delivery is, is critical to investigate because ultimately to deliver Pegasus or any of these other exploits, you know, Kind of the gold standard outside of a true zero click is you know a kind of one click or leveraging a safari based exploit or webkit exploit right because ultimately you get somebody to visit a domain and that remote server then delivers the the full exploit payload that then exploits the underlying device what's really interesting to me is that you know in this iteration of pegasus and, and i say iteration because pegasus itself is just a software platform that's you know sold out there and like any software platforms, it has different iterations as the mobile systems evolve. But when you think about the objective, the first objective of delivering the exploit payload is just to get a user to a website. Phishing is one aspect. But the other aspect, which the user has no control over, is let's say somebody takes over the network connection of the device, you know, especially with a you know, a targeted delivery where you get somebody to connect to a rogue access point or you intercept their network traffic and basically force that device to visit that domain that's going to deliver the exploit payload. Now you're getting into zero click territory where the user has no hope at that point. So it goes back to, you know, I think the methods of delivery are varied and we're seeing the evolution on that, but the underlying fact of, I need to get somebody to visit a place to deliver an exploit payload remains the same. And you get into, okay, how do you prevent that? And what goes into play if the user, if the attacker is delivering a phishing payload outside of corporate purview, or if you have privacy concerns or where, you know, say the attacker controls the network, 
uh, detection, the network area, you get in means methods and how you actually prevent that, you know, and our approach is on device and being able to keep up with threats, you know, without having to update things. But it's really interesting kind of that evolution that we've seen on the underlying software platform that is Pegasus and a lot of other similar attacks that we see out there in the wild with the delivery mechanisms. Yeah, no, I think you're, uh, I think you're, you're spot on, and especially as people start going back to work. And I know we've, you know, got questions around, you know, new variants of COVID, et cetera. But as people do start going back to work, more and more man in the middle attacks, more and more rogue access points are going to occur. And with that kind of infix where it's like stuck in the middle, you might not even necessarily be needing to get fished because they can choose where they're going to, where they're going to redirect you. And we're going to get to the solution part of it in a minute, but I'm old, um, so I get to say this. I've been I've been around for a billion years. No, I'm just kidding. But I have been around for most of cybersecurity, and some of the fundamental principles absolutely apply here. And defense in depth, even within one endpoint, is critical. Um, so if I'm looking for a solution, when we get to that part. I'm basically saying, how can I have multiple tripwires and multiple triggers at different parts so that maybe something got super sophisticated and passed one, but then there's others that you still need to be able to detect, right? So Nico, in the end, ultimately Pegasus and other spyware, and we even you know, discovered a uh, fake system update that we um, blogged about and disclosed earlier in the year, when these, when these uh, the more sophisticated spyware actually compromise a device like Pegasus, and let's just use Pegasus as, as the specific example, because that's what everyone's here for. Once it does that, what can it actually do? What, what can it see? What can it control? And like, what can it actually do? So the short answer to that is everything. So everything is happening on the device. Uh, we're talking about reading the SMS, reading calendar events, uh, tracking calls, uh, uh, getting collecting passwords, uh, accessing the location. Actually, there was um, some reported that was uh, killed in Mexico, and they think that uh, the, his location was tracked by using Pegasus. Uh, it can access the microphone and the camera. So let's uh, suppose you're in a meeting, they can have complete control of your microphone and can be recording everything that is happening in, in, on that meeting. Also taking pictures, uh, that maybe it's not the most useful feature because most of the time the device is not pointing to uh, anywhere useful. Uh, the other thing that it's doing, Pegasus specifically, it's uh, getting information about all the apps that are installed on the device. And the reason for that is because they also have um, exploits for specific applications. They are tracking Telegram, Signal, WhatsApp, so now it's a, a very common misconception to assume that because an application is using end-to-end -end encryption, which most messaging apps are using, uh, we are protected, which is not really the case. Now, once they are on the device and they are root on the device, they, they can access all the decrypted information that we uh, are able to see on the screen. Uh, then Pegasus was also able to take screenshots. Uh, so even, even if they were not able to decrypt your messages, if the app was open, we can get a screenshot and, and I literally read them. Uh, was, uh, it's also able to read emails, uh, contact list, and the browsing history, you name it. And basically, whatever is happening on the device, they can do it. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I think it's critical, again, you know, the analogy I use, because a lot of times, you know, I think analogies help visualize things, right? Uh, when it comes to mobile device security, I literally think of it like a tanker ship, right? All the apps are in their own little containers. They're, they, you know, and if you wanted to go from one, if you wanted to see into all of the containers or whatever the case may be, you take over the ship. And that's, and that's exactly what Pegasus has done is it's taken over the ship so now all the things that are on the ship, including to your point, Nico, the keys for encryption, they have, right? They, they've got complete access, uh, complete access to those, all of those various different things. Um, so um, Kern, um, any other you know, thoughts in terms of, uh, of the capabilities? Yeah, no, I think I think Nico hit on some critical things. I mean, the other thing I'd add is you know, the concept of secure containers on a mobile device. Um, 
you know, it, it's good if the device isn't compromised in this way, but once you compromise the device, doesn't matter what security you've put on an app level from a you know, secure container uh, perspective, if it doesn't have awareness that the device is compromised, that entire security foundation crumbles. And through no fault of anyone, it's just the way the OSs are, the OSs are designed. Um, so just, you know, one thing of note, is, especially when we're talking about securing corporate data, you know, there's end -end encryption, there's encryption on the container level, there's, you know, restrictions that you can put on an application level, et cetera, or even using a management system or an MDM. But a system like Pegasus or anything that compromises the device on the level that they're gaining access to, they're going to be override all the security controls. Those security controls go completely out the window at that point. That's perfect. So, um, Nico, I have one other question for you on this. And then we have two great questions that I'm actually going to ask now instead of waiting, because I think they're perfect in context. Um, the question I have for you is, I, is it, I've heard that some of the research has come back and said, one of the capabilities of Pegasus is the ability for it to actually delete logs as well. Um, have, have we encountered that at all? Or is that a possibility? Um, you know, where we've heard like stage fright, when we discovered stage fright, one of the things stage fright did, which similar capability, is it deleted the text message that originally delivered it, right? Have we seen any of, of the evidence to support the, the thoughts that Pegasus can pretty much delete its own logs and tracks, et cetera? Yes, and actually they put a lot of effort to cover all their tracks. Uh, we we uh, need to look into very specific places to actually see what happened. Uh, and in most cases, there is no trace whatsoever. So before you were uh, making this analogy about taking control of the ship, and in order to do that, um, most you need basically to uh, be root on the device, right? So in order to, to take control, you need to do that. And that's uh, the main strength, but at the same time, the main weakness of Pegasus, because if you detect that, uh, you are detecting Pegasus somehow, or, or we are detecting something similar to that. And that is actually what we are doing. Usually we're not focusing on detecting um, causes, but, but effects. So that's what we're detecting. If someone actually jailbroke, jailbroke a device or, or root a device uh, without the user doing it, that's a very strong indication of, of an attack. And also one of the questions was if this is only possible on Android or both Android and iOS. Uh, the latest leak actually was uh, focusing only on iOS. So people has also this misconception of iOS being a way more secure environment, which is not the case. So the, the latest leak was uh, talking only about iOS, uh, but we've seen this on both Android and iOS. And JD, if you want, I can also answer the, the other question, which is uh, related to <clears throat> the remote access Trojan. Yes, yeah, please do. So, so well, someone, someone is asking about um, if Pegasus would be classified as a remote access Trojan. Uh, this is more, it, it's more in the um, category of a uh, spyware than a Trojan. It cannot take control of the device and exercise the UI and that kind of stuff. It's like a uh, silent watcher. And to call it somehow. So it would be more like a spyware than a, than a Trojan. Perfect. That is perfect. All right. So let's, let's move, um, you know, briefly, Nico, can you give us, uh, are there any other kind of insights, you know, in terms of what we have seen um, from our, you know, tens of millions of endpoints around the world? Uh, any, any particular insights before we pivot over to how do we solve this problem? Sure. So um, as I just said, we are usually not trying to detect named uh, vulnerabilities or, or named um, uh, malwares. Uh, but what, what we are detecting in this case is someone tampering with the system. So we have a specific threat that is called system tampering. And what we have seen, uh, I would say from mid um, uh, next uh, last year, is a spike and, uh, and rise in system tampering in both Android and uh, iOS. So that's something that we have seen. Uh, there is something that there's something else that we can mention, which is related to the delivery mechanism. They are using specific URLs and they are actually, they are putting a lot of efforts also to cover the infrastructure and for each attack to be a very uniquely crafted URL. And that is also something that we can prevent and not even prevent, but block. So, uh, we, as Karen said before, we have on-device uh, real-time detection. 
So if any of our customers was visiting uh, a Pegasus link, we were not only able to uh, report that, but also to block that access. So we were completely stopping the compromise of the device. So those are the two things that we could see. Um, because as I said, we are checking generic tracks. We are not looking for Pegasus breadcrumbs, but these uh, higher events. Um, so for us, Pegasus is not different from other uh, threads that are in the market. So for example, uh, FinSpy, which is from a company that's called FinFisher is doing exactly the same and it's for uh, for sale for uh, to, to state actors. We have also a hacking team in Italy that they are selling uh, also these kind of tools. Uh, we have dark, dark Matter that is doing the same. So for us, it's much better to be able to detect these effects of the attack than to actually detect Pegasus. And we definitely have seen uh, a rise in, in all these sort of threats uh, from mid uh, last year. Yeah, no, I think that's that's perfect. And when we, we're going to, Kern's now going to be talking here. We're going to have I, ask another question real quick. Um, but the it is important to distinguish between protection and reporting, right? Um, and so the protection part, we have always believed there's zero days. It's more important to stop something than name something, right? Um, so we've been in the business to your point, Nico, of what are the generic approaches to be able to detect whether or not there's system tampering or, you know, as an example. Um, so we've been focused on that more than naming. Um, but there are folks who would like the naming piece from a reporting standpoint, if, if nothing else, right? And so starting to put in specific classifiers, as Kern will talk about, for specific things that people weren't reporting on, but it's a secondary issue. You know, don't try and detect everything by a specific signature, for lack of a better term. You need to detect it. So um, the the question, Nico, before we move on, was uh, thank you for this. But I heard they have the ability to upload and remove media. That would mean that they would have direct control, not just a spectator. Does that does that make sense in terms of uh, it's it's more of a probably an observation than a question? But what are what are your thoughts about that that point? So that's a part of the of the uh, attack chain. Actually, what they are deleting, it's not necessarily media. So in the case, uh, so what they are deleting is, for example, all the browser history. So if you were target of one of these redirections on Safari, there won't be anything there. Uh, but that's immediate. It's not that someone is remotely controlling the device and, and saying, go and delete the browser history. They are also deleting um, databases. They are deleting entries on databases. They are um, disabling the crash logs, uh, reporting to Apple. So they are doing a lot of stuff, but all is part of the attack. It's not that someone is actively controlling your device, um, but it's mostly about extracting data from the device. Okay, I, so I think, I think it, over, I'm sorry, go ahead. Actually, real quick, I mean, Nico, I think it's fair to say pretty much all, all options are on the table for, you know, for Pegasus or Pegasus-like attacks. I mean, the, the actual methodology or, or what whoever is operating that software system may differ based on who is operating it. Some people may go into observation mode only because they want to do more uh, passive spying. Others may go into more active remote command and control where they're actively exfiltrating or even candidly placing data into there that may be compromising to the user as well. So I, I think the larger point around Pegasus or Pegasus-like attacks is that everything is on the table, right? Because once they have that level of command and control over the device, they can do pretty much anything they want at that point. It's just a question of what's their choice? What, what, what is the objective of that exploit or the operator of the exploit platform? Which is, which is perfect, Kern, because for instance, we have another great question and folks, thank you for throwing these questions in. We're picking and choosing some of the ones that are relevant directly in context. Um, but there was one specifically that came in and said, you spoke about Pegasus having the ability to access camera, microphone, app data, et cetera. Does Pegasus also have write access, e.g. can it send a WhatsApp message? Nico? Uh, there is no evidence that Pegasus is doing that, but uh, it, should be pretty straightforward to actually instrument that. But yeah, there, there's no evidence that that happened. Okay, yeah. so there's, there's no evidence of it, but similar to 
the ability to turn on a microphone or turn on a camera. There's nothing kind of inherently that says it wouldn't have that ability if it had compromised the device. Exactly. It, okay. There is nothing Perfect. preventing that, but yeah, no, no yeah. answer. And, and one thing to add on there, and that's what makes these type of attacks so insidious because unless you have some way of detecting that the underlying device is compromised in any type of way, now the bad actor can basically assume the user's identity. So everything the user has access to on the device, they have access to, and they can also imitate the user and bypass any of those external controls because it's a trusted account. It's a trusted device, it's a trusted user. So it doesn't matter if you're talking about WhatsApp, Signal, Telegram, or even email platforms, as a, as a bad actor, I could place a media file or a file onto the said device. I could then leverage those trusted communication channels to do my lateral movement off of that mobile phone onto other endpoints that that phone is communicating to. So while there may not be direct evidence that Pegasus specifically was leveraging that in, in different ways, but there's nothing to say that they weren't either because those capabilities are absolutely on the table. Absolutely. So let's, um, in the interest of time, let's now pivot. And again, we're only going to spend a few minutes on this, but we think it is pretty critical for folks to, to get a feel for how can you go about solving this problem? And clearly, this is what we're in business for and have been in business mm -hmm. for. We've been protecting enterprises on both uh, endpoints and apps for, you know, over, you know, a dozen years now, right? Um, so that's what we do. Uh, when it comes to this, the majority of the folks that need to worry about it are folks protecting their endpoints. So, Karen, can you just tee up what, you know, our solution, and then we're going to pop over and have you actually show live in the system kind of what this would look like in terms of detection. But can you explain, okay, we just got finished yeah. talking about these things. And as you said, if you don't have a way of being able to know whether there's phishing attacks or know whether a device is compromised, how do you do that? How, how does ZIPS and the machine learning engine Z9 inside of it yeah. address this problem? Yeah, so it's important to consider the evolution of, of these type of platforms, right? And, and Pegasus or systems like Pegasus, and there's a variety of them out there, Nico named a few, but Pegasus is just the mo one of the more famous examples of this type of program being sold actively in different marketplaces. And like any platform or software platform, it's gonna to continue to evolve, right? The attackers are gonna to try to use new novel methods. They're gonna use new different exploits, new different attacks. So while the program may be named Pegasus, the underlying exploits and vulnerabilities and the method of delivery is gonna to continue to change and evolve, right? And so our approach is around how can we generically detect on device, and it's critical to do this on device because again, if the attacker has command and control, of the network or ultimately the device, you have no hope if you're using cloud-based analytics or trying to do backtracking on forensics, et cetera. So you have to do the detection on device is how can you generically detect the impact or the effects of this type of exploitation, but also the lead up, the delivery of the exploit package at that point. And how do you do it in a way that is not reliant on explicit signatures, but more generic impact. And that's where our Z9 engine comes into play of using machine learning based classifiers that sit on the device and generically detect for these type of tax and methods to give you multi-layered approaches on this stuff. So for us, if we think about the uh, payload of, of or the, pay, the current variety of Pegasus, JT, I don't know if you mind uh, letting me share my screen here real quick. Absolutely. I just want to walk some folks through this. Yeah. So if we think about what happens in this scenario, Right, and this is where um, we come into play with with the different capabilities, et cetera. And can uh, JT just keep me fresh here? Can you see my screen with the console? Yep, yep perfect. perfect. See the see right. threat matrix. Yeah. So really, you're looking at what's the lead up, right? So when we think about this instance of Pegasus, we're thinking, well, there was a lead up on phishing that could have happened, right? So we may want to look for those threats. We could also say look for any type of midum. Uh, threats or say a rogue access point as well. But in this case, we'll keep it straight to phishing. But then we know because it's a one click or zero click vulnerability, you're going to see some sort of compromise that takes place. So we're going to be looking for something along the lines of system tampering. 
And then because we know customers are specifically interested around this variant of Pegasus, we're going to be able to go beyond the generic capabilities. And we've actually added a specific classifier based off the Pegasus attack. So if we look at that kill chain, we're going to be able to trigger in this scenario the type of phishing capabilities that took, that took place with the link either being tapped or visited. And we can get into the whole aspect of you know, what that means and why it's important to have multiple methods of phishing detection based off of your use case, but also the underlying compromise of the device with the system tampering event, mapping up to MITRE. And then now that there's a known vulnerability or known exploit, we can actually name it with Pegasus beyond just the generic capabilities and detections that we would have. And again, it goes back to just the general approach, being able to detect for these type of threats generically, regardless of how they're being presented, and doing so even if they're unknown at that point in time from true zero data uh, per perspective, and then being able to have those layers of detection. So regardless if it's a phishing site, a malicious application, a network-based uh, network inbound, or even say a USB or physical-based attack, having those detections in layers to give you full, full insight into what actually took place and how it happened, and then ultimately being able to make generic detections around the impact to the device, and then leveraging any of the forensics or specific capabilities to name the actual underlying exploiter method that was being used. So I'll stop right there. That is, uh, that is perfect. And we are um, near the uh, end of time, but we do have a few more questions. Um, so I'm going to hit a few of those questions, folks. If you have more, um, feel free to throw them in. Um, Nico, there's a couple that are, I think are kind of related, um, you know, and it basically has to do with what kind of system level capabilities and access, again, that a, that a uh, uh, capability like, like Pegasus could actually pull off. Um, and so I'll kind of lump them together. Uh, it was, can Pegasus add new permissions to the device, i.e. allowing location microphone access for itself or another app? And then it, another one asked about certain devices have fail safes, like green orange dots on iOS when the microphone or camera is accessed. Can Pegasus disable these system level fail safes so it can access the camera without the green dot being turned on? Um, so again, I think it's that lump of what is possible with a solution like Pegasus. Oh, you're on. Sorry, I wasn't. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so about the fail safe, I think that's not, uh, you cannot bypass that. So that those mechanisms are designed in that way. About permissions, uh, this is mostly relevant on Android. And if those permissions, uh, so some, some permissions can be granted, but uh, I, I don't really see the use case for that. And we haven't seen any malware doing that. And I, I don't think that's really possible. Well, um, uh, sorry, real quick, real quick yeah. on that one. I think the, the relevant thing is, is that because we're talking about compromising devices, permissions are not relevant at that point. Once you've compromised the device, you have full access to everything. So there's no granting of permissions because you own the entire device at that point in time. So permissions become irrelevant. Yeah, exactly. So granting a permission actually would be useful for the user. So there is an application that now the user will be able to do something else, but you don't want that. What you want is actually to be able to read the application uh, uh, data, data folder. And once you are root and you can do that, then you don't need to do anything else. So yes, uh, adding permission is not something that is uh, really relevant in this attack. Um, there is also a question about self-destruction mechanism, and uh, that means that there is no forensics. Well, they, they are trying. They are trying really, really hard to hide all the forensics evidence that is out there. But since you need to root the device, you need to do it somehow. Also, they want to achieve persistence. So um, it, it's very difficult, but if you know where to look, the evidence is there. Uh, not sure, JT, if I forgot to uh, answer something. Um, actually, what, uh, what we're going to do now in the interest of time is we have a bunch of questions. We will respond back directly to everybody because there are some great, uh, great questions that are in there, but we want to be respectful of uh, everybody's time. Uh, as I mentioned, there will be a copy of the recording up on the site. Um, if anybody has some specific urgent questions or, or, or requests, 
um, feel free to shoot me an email. It's jt.keating, K-E-A-T-I-N-G, at zimperium.com, and I'll facilitate that out to, to folks. So with that, I'd like to thank Kern and Nico and everybody that's been on this call. Um, again, feel free to reach out to us. Um, this is what we do and have been doing for quite some time. And we'll make sure we uh, take care of all the questions that we didn't get a chance to address here. So uh, Nico, Kern, thank you guys very much. And I wish everybody a great afternoon. Thank you very much. Thanks.